Apple Podcast. This week, you've got myself and Brennan, and we're going to be diving into uh, what might be like the first kind of normal variety weekend um, back at the box office. You, just, you have a selection now, uh, which we have not had for a long time. Um, so we're going to be jumping into some of those releases as well as ending out with the, the Movie Bible Club. Uh, the Word of the Dead is going to come up a lot today. Uh, I'm just going to put that out there. Um, but we're going to go ahead and start off with Spiral from the Book of Saw, uh, which is a name that sounds like marketing came up with it so as to not confuse the audience, um, which it's, I don't know, I'm getting big Dawn of Justice vibes in terms of how cringy that name is. I think Spiral is a pretty effective name in and of itself. Like you see the trailer, you immediately know, you know, what this is Saw. I mean, all the imagery is there. All of the uh, iconography is still there. So I don't know many people that would be like, hmm, I wonder what franchise this is. Um, but <laughs> uh, so this movie is, uh, I don't know, it was, at least in the marketing, it was almost pitched as like the 2018 Halloween in this whole like, we're going to reinvent the wheel here, kind of get back to basics. Um, bringing in Chris Rock was big news because um, you really haven't had just huge actors in these movies since the original. Um, and I mean, that one had Danny Glover and Carrie Elwise. Like that's a pretty loaded cast for what ended up becoming a, one of the more like not low budget, but more uh, B list talent uh, horror movies, horror franchises. Yeah. Um, so before we do jump in though, I do want to ask this is, have you seen all the saw films or at least a good variety of them? I have seen saw and that's it. <laughs> that's it. Okay. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, this film seems like it was, Obviously, I haven't quite seen it yet with theaters shut down here, but um, it seemed like this movie was certainly probably the biggest marketed Saw movie maybe in a long time. Like, the, I mean, the budget's higher than all the other ones. I think it's the $20 million, I think, is the highest budget we've seen for a Saw movie. Um, and obviously, as you said, bringing in Chris Rock. And is Samuel L. Jackson in this film as well? Uh, yeah, Samuel L. Jackson. Well, Samuel L. Jackson is occasionally in this film. Uh, okay, but he does disappear for large chunks of the runtime because uh, okay. he's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it does seem like it was certainly uh, pushed in a way that we that 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 just I I wouldn't expect from this franchise. But uh, here we are, and you got to see it in theaters. Uh, so how how was this movie? Um, so I I think in some ways it succeeded in kind of getting back to the spirit of the original song. Um, because you know, the, the original saw is the only one in this franchise that I've seen. And that's a pretty solid, like not quite a detective story, but it's a pretty solid, like mystery, good police story. Um, and certainly the elements that saw is now famous for, which is just like torture porn, um, are in there. Um, uh, but they're, they're done really cleverly. And, and, um, just the performances of Carrie Elwise and Danny Glover really help kind of cement that movie. And, you know, the big twist that nobody really saw coming. Um, and so I, I think in a lot of ways, this movie tries to mimic that. Um, I don't think we get anything near the depth um, that we had in the original saw. So there's, um, there's just a lot of exposition in this movie. Um, and probably about a good 15% of this movie is the same flashback with just slightly different narration over and over again. Um, but you have just every character in this movie is so wooden. Um, and none of them appear to be acting in the same movie. Like the performances are just so inconsistently toned. Um, and you have, you have Chris Rock who's out here like trying his best. He's trying to do this kind of hard hitting commentary about being, a you know, being a basically the only police officer who's not just an absolute criminal on the force. Um, and so, you know, he's, he's out here like really trying. And then, um, you've got all these other characters that are just there to be soft fodder. <laughs> and, and so it, it's just really flat in that um the twist because it's a saw movie so it's gonna have a twist um isn't too difficult to to pick up on um and and there's a lot of characters that are just kind of hanging out until it's their turn to be gutted um, <laughs> and samuel L. jackson is really weird because he's in probably like the first he has a major role in the movie but he's in probably like the first 15 minutes and then they just like don't address his character for like an hour. Um, then he kind of shows up again at the end. Um, and you're like, okay. <laughs> uh, there's a picture of him on a wall that they talk to a lot. Uh, so <laughs> this is like in the movie that way. <laughs> yeah. um, 
but yeah, there, there's a lot of like convenience and I honestly am just like trying to remember this movie because it feels like I watched a fever dream. Like it, it really feels like just kind of the student film version of saw, like somebody saw it and was like, yeah, I'm going to remake this. And then took like 10 of their friends and 20 bucks. And, um, it's kind of what we got story wise. Um, I do think some of the kills were pretty good and pretty inventive. Um, one of them I think could have been escaped really easily, but you know, maybe, maybe that's just me. Um, but it was, it was nice. They're like beating you over the head with the really overt symbolism of why they're like killing each of these characters this way. Um, but it was still like pretty tense to watch and pretty disgusting. So I, I feel like it, it does, it does live up to that part, but yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I can't call this a good movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, Saw fans. <laughs> I do want to do note though. So it opens up here below expectations at $8.7 million uh, this weekend um, in about 2,811 theaters. So it's certainly below expectations. I think at the, at this point, it's really difficult to project how movies are going to do. Like you have, I think the latest number right now is 65% of North American theaters are open. But at the same time, a lot of them are half capacity, a quarter capacity. I'm sure some are full, certainly, but uh, New York, I think, is uh, capped at a quarter. Um, so, so when you have 65% of theaters open, let's say roughly only 40% of them – sorry, let's say roughly 40% of the seats are available – that 65% of theaters is really more like 40% of theaters, if you get what I'm saying, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it opens up to $8.7 million, which was below the estimates of 10 to 15. So I think you could argue it's a disappointment, but at the same time, the movie cost $20 million to make. It'll probably do decent business overseas. Um, it's not going to take much to pass the budget with this one. So we'll see how it does internationally but I, I think it's like for, for what it is it's a decent opening and as you said I did I did want to point out just this weekend does feel pretty regular in terms of variety uh at the box office like we've been kind of starved for the last several weeks on on new releases um we spoke about before we got on about Godzilla versus Kong how big that opened up to at the end of March and really uh moviegoers I guess they didn't come back in massive ways for the movies that came out in the weeks following, but there wasn't really much out, you know? So I, I don't, I don't really put it on them, but this seems like the first weekend where, where we're seeing a lot of variety. So I did want to look at kind of what's out, if you don't mind. I mean, we have obviously the soft film, we have wrath of man in its second weekend, the, the new guy, Ritchie movie, uh, those who wish me dead, the Angelina Jolie, uh, Tyler Sheridan directed movie, obviously got the HBO max and theater release. Um, and big shout out to Demon Slayer, the Japanese <laughs> anime film, which is now the highest grossing movie in Japan ever. And is the, uh, I believe it officially has become the highest grossing movie of 2020 because officially in Japan, it came out in October of, of 2020. Um, Ray and the Last Dragon is like kicking it 10% drop this weekend. Uh, Godzilla, Godzilla versus Kong is, is still up there. Mortal Kombat still in there. So, I mean, the variety, I think, is there right now. Like, we're seeing, if you go to the theaters, you have, you got an R-rated anime movie. You have a, a Disney animated film. You have Godzilla vs. Kong still out there. You have a Guy Ritchie. You got an Angelina Jolie thriller. You got a Saw movie. Like, it's it's starting to kind of look like a normal theater setting again. And I hope as we see kind of the summer months progress, things get better revenue-wise. And as more theaters open, um, would you agree that just thinking about it now that Godzilla versus Kong opening in March was really goddamn impressive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, big monkey that theaters <laughs> back. Um, like I just like the theaters were what, maybe 55% of them were open. Probably a lot of them were very limited, limited capacity and it blew up. Like I'm just completely shocked by, by the business it did in March. Yeah, and I think that's especially impressive given how available it was on HBO Max because that's, you know, like 40-some-odd million people that could theoretically watch it um, in their homes for no additional cost. Um, but yeah, I, I think that was a big part of kind of the return to the theaters wave. I think Ryan the Last Dragon uh, was a big part of that too. And again, that was another movie that 
Um, you also had the Disney Plus option for. Uh, but now we're starting to get into, I think Saw is kind of the first franchise to come back without that immediate um, digital di- digital option to it. Because um, I know, like, personally, as someone who wasn't big into the Saw franchise, I was kind of hoping this would be on HBO Max. So I was like, save a 20-minute drive. Um, but, yeah, so I, so I think this was kind of one of our first big franchise tests. And, you know, again, this is Saw, so it's not expected to make just hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad big monkey could, uh, could run. So saw could walk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's it. Um, but yeah, so that, that is a spiral from the book of the saw. Uh, can't say I'm a fan. Uh, maybe it very heavily sets up a sequel. Um, which I, I think the movie, it's, it's one of those things where the movie it sets up is more interesting than the movie that's actually there. Um, and so I think there's like, there's some, there's some little nuggets at the end where you're like, you know what, there could be a really cool story here. Um, and so if it makes enough money, maybe we'll get, uh, what, it, what, what they actually wanted this movie to be, um, here in a few years. <laughs> As always, I was setting up the sequel. <laughs> um, but there were some other releases. Um, so I know you got a chance to check out the woman in the window, uh, this week who, who can forget that trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. So this is a movie I've been looking forward to for 18 months, believe it or not. Um, Late 2019, I heard this was coming and I know it's a pretty good book. I know people who have read the book and who loved the book and the cast looked phenomenal. Joe Wright, I think, is a director who maybe he hasn't been as good as he was in the 2000s, but he's he's Joe Wright. So, I mean, I I was confident Um, and it was supposed to come out last um, last spring in theaters and then COVID hit and finally, um, Fox sold it to, um, Netflix or, or kind of partnered with Netflix there. So Netflix could roll out this movie and, you know, it's number one on Netflix right now. So it's doing its job that way. Like it's, it's certainly, uh, made a big splash on Netflix, but it really is not a great movie at all. <laughs> uh, really a misfire. And it's sad for, for me, cause I was looking forward to it for so long. Um, a lot of that was the delays and such. That's kind of why my anticipation got prolonged. But really, this movie was a disappointment. I think <sighs> there's just so much of a of a of a mess in there. I think there there is a story to be told, but it's just really not told in an interesting way for a movie that's really trying to go for that Alfred Hitchcock, David Fincher type vibe of mystery thriller kind of edgier seat type stuff, they really miss the whole concept of actually wanting to keep the viewer interested. Because for the <laughs> majority of it, I'm not I'm not bored really, but I'm just not really interested in what's going on because I don't really know what is going on. I, I really don't. And it, it, for that, it, it makes an interesting watch because it's kind of uh, a messy uh, a mo- movie with a lot of A-listers that you can laugh at. But it, it certainly was a misfire in my opinion. I, I've seen some people enjoy it, but I think the vast majority of people are pretty low on this movie. And I knew whenever they scheduled this thing for May that that it probably wasn't going to be as good as I had hoped. Yeah. Um, I just remember this trailer more than anything. Um, this was like <laughs> one of the last ones before the Rona really shut everything down that, you know, played before every movie. But yeah, once, once I started hearing reactions to it, um, I, I didn't hear anything positive. Um, it, and it looks like a pretty interesting premise. Um, just like really going for kind of that voyeur rear window kind of vibe. Um, and this is, you know, coming from me as someone who is unfamiliar with the book. Um, and so whose impression of it is, you know, based on an entirely different movie. Um, but you have a really good cast behind it too. I mean, Amy Adams, always fun to watch, um, struggling a little bit, uh, following up Hillbilly Elegy with this. (laughs) Um, but then you have Julianne Moore, you have Gary Oldman, um, Anthony Mackie's in here, I believe, right? And Wyatt Russell getting that Falcon and the Winter Soldier team back up. Um, so you have like a, a solid team behind it. So I think was at least that part interesting, just getting to watch the cast. I guess so. I mean, like I, I, I'm, I'm, I like Gary Oldman. I like his work, but his he was pretty annoying in this movie. Um, there, there, there isn't really. Um, it, it's kind of weird to say, but there isn't really. I, I'm not gonna blame him for this because it's kind of just the way the things were set up. But there's so many scenes where 
Amy Ad- I think this happened maybe three times. Amy Adams is just in her house and the, the there are detectives there questioning her and Gary Oldman just barges in and he's like her neighbor and he just barges <laughs> in and starts like kind of preaching about stuff. And I'm like, I don't think that's like, it did, It just didn't feel normal. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a weird nitpick, but it's hilarious because it keeps happening over and over. I'm like, this guy just has like a key or something and he just keeps <laughs> walking in. Um, but, but yeah, uh, it, I guess having those A-listers made it a little bit more interesting for sure. But um, no, I don't know. There, there wasn't too much here for me to look back on in a great light. I think there are a few scenes that are kind of redeemable. There's some very cool scenes. And Joe Wright's a solid director. And the film is shot really well. I think the cinematography is great. Um, the color palette's really good in this. And there, as I said, there are a few scenes that look quite good. But there isn't really much for me to uh, latch onto with this. It's a, it's a shame. Um, it also is a big Netflix move. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I really don't have anything else to add. Um, sounds like as far as the uh, thriller department goes between Spiral and Woman in the Window, there really wasn't wasn't a whole <laughs> lot going on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, crazy weekend though for movies. But now uh, I think we got to talk about uh, a lot of dead things now. Yeah, uh, so Netflix making some some bad and good moves out here this weekend. Um, so Army of the Dead is the uh, the next Zack Snyder magnum opus uh, that comes out, um, which is not a sequel to Dawn of the Dead, uh, even though they have very similar titles. Um, but it did get a limited, I believe it's just seven days, just that week-long um, pre-run, basically. Um, it's a theatrical run before it drops on Netflix. So this was fairly limited. Um, I know, like... In my local movie theater, we normally get a little bit of everything, but this was not available. Um, but yeah, Netflix, it looks like they're really pushing hard for this movie. Um, you know, I, honestly, it kind of feels like they're hoping that this will be this year's The Old Guard or this year's Six Underground. Um, just kind of that big action movie that they've, I mean, they pumped $90 million into <laughs> into making it. Um, it just kind of takes off and, and captures the world for a couple of weeks. Um, but it did did have its run um, this week and pulled in uh, not just crazy amounts of money, but uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so 780,000 is the number that they're reporting right now. And reports were that this thing would get up to 800 theaters. And just kind of for scale, Wrath of Man's playing in 3,000 right now. Saw is playing in 2,800. Um, whenever our summer gets into full blow, we hope to have 4,500 theaters open. Like that's kind of the maximum. So it's, it was reported to be playing in 800. Now reports are saying, no, it's actually only in 430 theaters. So it's really not in a whole heck of a lot of theaters. I mean, 430 theaters for a limited run movie is pretty big, but it's nowhere near a wide scale release. So I think, I think 780,000 for 430 theaters is probably pretty good. It's it's certainly less than I expected the movie to make, but learning now that it's really only in about 430 theaters across North America, I think 780 is not bad. It's also Netflix is now able to say um, this is their biggest opening ever at the box <laughs> office. I think Roma uh, had the record before. They had a $200,000 five-day Thanksgiving launch in 2018. So to have about 780 grand this weekend for Army of the Dead is not bad. I think it's smart of them too because... You have a lot of hardcore Snyder fans, right? And they're going to go watch this movie in the theater and that's if, if they can find it. And that's kind of what happened. And I have no doubt that, as you said, in seven days' time, this thing's going to be number one on Netflix and uh, they're going to release ridiculous numbers of how many people watch this thing. Yeah, and I think it comes at an interesting time because um, we're kind of in the middle of a, a Dave Bautista essence, um, just with the Knives Out um, casting announcement this past week and and, you know, he's got Dune coming up. He's got Army of the Dead. So he's really cementing himself as kind of a leading man. And so you're really, you're, you're marrying uh, the Marvel bros and the DC bros with a, a Bautista Snyder Snyder combo right now. It's a smart, it's a smart move for sure. It certainly is. I did want to also just, I'm going to keep hammering this in because I have been for weeks now. I think Netflix should be putting movies in theaters more. I think this is a good move. Um, and, and especially in a time where theaters are probably a bit more desperate than usual. Like it's not like 2019, 2018, when you had 
five billion dollar movies come out in the summer like this it, it's a time now where i think this should be adopted a little bit more i think netflix should try to work away with some sort of theater chain to get like a semi-wide release 430 is pretty low i'm thinking somewhere in the like 1000 theater range release your big blockbuster movies in theaters for a week i think that's a cool move and it's like it, it, it's just extra cash for netflix right i don't think there's really a downside of doing it it's good press maybe and it's it's just a little bit of extra cash and i hope to see this happen again for netflix i think movies like as you said six underground the old guard this uh, army of the dead here i think throwing them in theaters for a week um in semi wide uh in a semi-wide scale would be kind of cool and i do hope that's something that we see in the coming years yeah um and i think netflix is really invested in this for the long term so there's a there's a spin-off tv series coming out um, I believe later this year, that's going to be kind of an anime style uh, where the the cast from this movie is returning to voice their characters um, in a prequel um, to, to Army of the Dead. So they're, they're kind of going for a long-term game here. And I would imagine uh, based on the way they've kind of greenlit sequels for their super big explosive movies before, we'll probably get an Army of the Dead 2 or, you know, whatever of the dead you want to name it um, here in a few years as well. Uh, but I'm I'm kind of excited for it. I think, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes. But I think uh, Dawn of the Dead is is a, one of the stronger Snyder movies. And you know, obviously, this is not that movie. Um, it's not even the same franchise. But I think it kind of brings the spirit of that movie back from what I've seen of the trailers. So I'm I'm excited to see uh, how it turns out next week. Yeah. No. Me. Me too. Do you think you wanna you wanna jump into it now then? Let's let's go. Uh, so this week was Movie Babble Club uh, round like what are we on like twelve maybe uh, thirteen something like that. Um, but you went ahead and picked uh, the two thousand four epic Dawn of the Dead. Uh, so do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So I mean, I uh, picked this movie this week just basically because Army of the Dead was coming out. So I knew that Snyder had a zombie movie coming, so I said, why not Why not uh, revisit his directorial debut, which was 2004's Dawn of the Dead, which is a remake, obviously, of the 1978 film from George A. Romero, Dawn of the Dead. I watched both this week. Um, I'm, I'm actually more of a fan of the original uh, after watching them. I think, I mean, we'll get into it, but I, I, I liked both quite a bit but I am more of a fan of that original film. So yeah, I mean, going back to basics here for Zack Snyder, this is his debut movie back in 2004. You got James Gunn writing the screenplay as well, which is kind of cool. Um, I think this movie in particular is is kind of one of the movies that started the 2000s, 2010s trend of zombies. I think it became pretty big, and this, was, this had to be one of the movies to start that off. Obviously, you had 28 Days and 28 Weeks Later, in the 2000s as well and that kind of leads into 2010 with the walking dead and that which blew up in the 2010s early 2010s uh more specifically um i, I really do think zombies took over <laughs> <laughs> pop culture for a little while around that period and you could tip this movie as one of the launch pads for that sort of uh pop culture sensation that we saw a decade ago now almost um yeah, I mean, it's for me. It's it was a good movie. Did you uh, did you enjoy this? Yeah, so I I can't say I'm a I'm a huge fan. Um, I do think this is my favorite Snyder movie, uh, and I haven't seen the classic Owls of Gahul, so I can't compare it to that. Um, but but out of basically all of the super movies, hero movies that I've seen, um, I think this is my favorite Snyder movie. Um, I think it's a strong taste of like what James Gunn really was. Um, Cause at that point he'd already had a Scooby-Doo under his belt. Um, and actually this came out the, the same year as Scooby-Doo too. So we got like a toned down version of him. Uh, but this is what we, this is the first time we get to see the James Gunn that we'd really meet in Slither, um, which follows a lot of the themes for that. Uh, that being said, I don't think all of his ideas are really compatible with Snyder's style. Um, it's really, weird to see Zack Snyder with developed characters. Uh, I, I just wasn't expecting that when I watched this movie. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree in thinking that the original is better. Um, I, I feel like this movie just kind of misses the mark on 
the simplicity of the first movie, which a lot of that is budget and just the fact that scares are always ramping up. Um, but a lot of that is also just like the thematic kind of the, the simple way that Romero kind of conveys the consumerism message um, in the original 1978 film. But I think the horror elements of this movie work really well. Uh, big Ty Burrell fan. So I like seeing him just do anything. Uh, I think the zombie baby scene is really fun. Uh, also just like really <laughs> creepy. And yeah. And I, I think the uh, like there are really these good moments of humor that feel very James Gunnish, like where they're sitting on the roof sniping all the, the celebrity zombies. Um, so yeah, I, I think this movie is a, a solid like popcorn flick. Very enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is, and I, I, I did quite like it. I think this movie did what a remake should do, and took some risks and changed it up a bit. Like the zombies are no, they're no Walking Dead zombies in this movie, right? They are more in the vein of your World War Z zombie, uh, running around, uh, really chasing you down. So I mean, I think that in a way, this this remake did what I think remakes should do, and that is update the material in a way that's interesting. Um, it did somewhat keep it the basics kind of being confined to a shopping mall right like they didn't i thought they because i had I actually hadn't seen this movie before uh, i'd seen bits and pieces uh when i was younger but i'd never watched it in full i expected something a little different setting wise but they did go back to the shopping mall from the first um for me you know i i think the first 15 minutes of this movie are the strongest personally um i'm a sucker for fast choppy edited real life news footage in an apocalypse movie <laughs> i don't know I, it's just something i love to see i think it's perfect for setting the tone a lot of people really hate it and think it's cheesy but i'm a big fan of seeing it uh just at kind of the start of a movie to kind of get you in there and i think this movie sets up the world really well from the point of our lead uh character there um, she's a nurse and she's in the hospital. You, you hear kind of the rumblings of something going on. She goes home overnight, kind of the world has gone to hell and you, you get into that opening credits of, of all the news clips. Um, and even there's, there's that one iconic shot that's now probably a pretty iconic gif of her standing in her front yard and there's that pan shot across her <laughs> neighborhood. You see like helicopters, you see like fire in houses, people are running and screaming. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that I think the movie has a really good setup, and from there on out, you're just kind of watching a good zombie movie, just a good enjoyable zombie movie. Nothing really to take away from it fully. Um, this movie also did that. I mean, this movie did the original, or this movie did the intro very well. I think the original movie also was very good at tone setting. You go back to that original film, and you have them kind of start out in a news station and everyone's kind of reporting what's going on it's hectic um, they're talking like there's so many rumors about what these things really are is it like uh airborne is it viral um people are talking about how to kill them how it's spreading stuff like that and it's just all in a news station you don't really know what's going on outside i think both movies really do set up their worlds quite well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it, it was a good time, though, for sure. It's neat to, neat to go back to basics for Snyder there, especially after what we're seeing this year with the scale and the size of his uh, two films this year, the Snyder Cut <laughs> and Army of the Dead. So <laughs> it's it's it just kind of cool to go back to his uh, his first film. Yeah, and what I, what I really like about this movie is it lacks a lot of the pretension of... Um, specifically like the Snyder cut or Watchmen or a lot of his movies where th there's just a lot of pretentiousness about what's actually being said when there's really nothing super nuanced or deep <laughs> going on there. Um, this movie feels really unburdened by trying to do something really serious or make some kind of, you know, dramatic statement. Um, and, and so I do like that it's kind of this bare bones, like stripped down version um, before it just kind of went off the rails with beating you over the head with, um, you know, we, we, we don't need to get into Batman v Superman. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I do want to read this quote from George A. Romero because he was still alive at the time that this movie came out. Um, this was his reaction. It was better than I expected. The first 15 to 20 minutes were terrific, but it sort of lost its reason for being. It was more of a video game. I'm not terrified of things running at me. It's like Space Invaders. There was nothing going on underneath. 
Uh, so I don't think I'd be that harsh about it, but I do agree. I think the opening 15 minutes, um, just that whole sequence when she's in her neighborhood um, and you have the zombie little girl just kind of shuffle into their house and you're, you know, you can see all the characters like trying to figure out what's going on. And then her, uh, is it a husband or a boyfriend? I can't remember. Uh, I don't think it matters, but <laughs> you get that, uh, that whole, whole scene with the attack of the little girl and then the husband gets bit and, and turns on her. And, and so I think, that's really strong. Um, I think the end sequence where they're trying to escape from the mall is really strong. Um, I, again, I like that baby sequence feels a little weird. Um, but I think that's, that's a pretty strong moment in the movie as well. So I, I think this movie works more than it does not. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, yeah, that baby sequence is pretty good. I, I was sitting there like, Oh, they're not going to do it. Are they, they're not going to go there, <laughs> but they did. And it was cool. And it is kind of that. Uh, I think that that's certainly the James Gunn touch on this movie. Sequences like that and scenes like that. Just kind of that kind of freaky visual. Um, that visual horror uh, of that of that zombie baby. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, it wasn't bad. I think that George A. Romero quote is is interesting. I, I agree with you. I wouldn't be as harsh, but I do. I do agree with what he with with his sentiments about that first fifteen to twenty minutes where this movie does have really solid world building and setup. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't call this the best a uh, zombie movie of of the last twenty years, but I do think it certainly kicked off or helped kick off a real pop culture uh, renaissance of the zombie, and it kind of led us into what probably was the most successful era of the zombie. Um, in the late 2000s, early 2010s, certainly an era that a lot of people uh, got into in some way or another. Yeah, and I think this was right before zombies, zombie movies started really poking fun at themselves. So this is kind of like the last, I don't want to say pure, but like the last before the genre really changed. Because I mean, two weeks after this came out, you got Shaun of the Dead. Um, and then uh, talking about that wave of zombies later uh, with Walking Dead, you have Zombieland, uh, which really did a lot of the same, like let's flip all these tropes and things on their head. Um, so this is kind of like the last hoorah. Uh, and it's interesting because this remake was actually coming out in the middle of a reboot of, or not a reboot, but a continuation of the original um, franchise as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a nice little isolated thing. I kind of like that the, since we never got a sequel, like the open end to this movie is really open ended. Um, I still prefer the original, but that's just me. Yeah, no, I agree for sure. It is. It does kind of leave you off with a solid open ending there. But yeah, I mean, I think the verdict is it's a good movie, but I'm also uh, more of a fan of that original. Yeah, so it's zombies, you know. <laughs> then we got Army of the Dead coming up, so I'm sure that'll be twice the explosions, uh, <laughs> which should be a lot of fun. That's that's kind of the vibe I'm getting. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and we'll be back next week with that. Uh, just kind of two weeks of a kind of zombie marathon here. Yeah, it's uh, just taking me back to the good old days of middle school. Uh, just zombies everywhere. Yeah, no kidding. It, it's, it, it's weird. Uh, it just kind of lined up that way, though, but I, I do hope army of the dead uh I, I do hope it's fun and i do i do think it'll be uh, enjoyable so we'll uh, we'll we'll check that out next week yeah so that has been this week's episode of the movie babble podcast uh, remember you can check us out online at moviebabble.com. 